Well, I'm Dr. David Johnson, Professor of Medicine and Chief of Gastroenterology at Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia. Well, esophageal strictures are something that we deal with in general gastroenterology routinely. Well, kudos to Dr. Todd Barron, who published his top 10 tips, if you will, on dilation of benign esophageal strictures. And I wanted to highlight some of these and then augment Todd's excellent top 10 with some anecdotal comments that I would add at, based on my 40 plus years of doing this as well and looking at potentially staying out of harm's way. Well, number one is the, the choose the endoscope appropriately based on what you expect for the luminal diameter of the stricture. Again, the standard endoscope is 10 millimeters. The stricture scopes or the smaller caliber scopes are six millimeters or less. And starting with this is one thing or being available, having it available and switching to that as needed if you get into a complex stricture that uh, you cannot traverse and you still want to go through, through the stricture. Again, it's important to understand the caliber makes a difference. Number two is general anesthesia. If uh, the patient has symptoms of esophageal obstruction and the typical clinical finding here would be that the patient can't handle their secretions. We see this in particular after food bolus obstructions, patients come in and I would agree with Todd, the best thing to do is proactively uh, and anticipatory uh, general intubation and using general anesthesia with these patients rather than getting in and having the patient now at aspiration risk and potentially sustaining an aspiration. Number three is do not apply excessive force and attempt to pass the endoscope past the stricture. So if you get to a stricture, you meet some resistance, don't push through it, back off it. And then if you don't know where the dynamics of the stricture, the length of the stricture, the angulation, you may have to come back another day if you can't traverse it with a smaller caliper scope. So again, don't apply and try and push your way through these strictures. Four is fluoroscopy, if, if particular the, the patient has a complex esophageal stricture. Why like this in benign strictures we're talking about, patients that have uh, angulation due to radiation. Uh, I, I've seen it a number of times in nasogastric tube or chemotherapy or drug-induced type of uh, esophagitis. Long strictures, they tend to be more of a, a transmural fibrosis. And, and again, you really need to understand where you're going with these when you start to pass the guide wire. If you don't have a barium study, then back out. You may want to start with a barium study before you reapproach these patients. I would agree wholeheartedly. Number five is the rule of three. Those are of us that were privileged back in the 80s uh, to work with Dr. Work Bo Work Boyce, one of the godfathers of the esophagus. Uh, and looking at what Dr. Boyce credited his mentor, Eddie Palmer, it looked at the rule of three applying to no successive dilation of a millimeter greater size if once you start to meet resistance. But this is all recognized by bougie dilators. So again, Dr. Barron's comment about using the, the rigid dilators when assessing benign stricture dilation does not apply to balloon dilation. So we have to understand that we're using more balloon dilators these days, but it is something that really reflects on the, the passage of a bougie dilator. So again, start with this and start to think about what your appropriateness and set targets. I particularly will assess the dynamics of the stricture and then look with discuss with the patient what my targets would be and really to get them to get to a diet that they can enjoy. So again, sometimes the worst enemy of good is perfect and you, you're not looking for a luminal size as much as you're trying to assess what the patient can go forward with. We do know that 15 or sorry, 13 millimeters or less is something that uniformly will create dysphagia for patients. That's why we give them a barium tablet and then we do a CINE study. Uh, but also 15 millimeters, most people can tolerate a soft diet and almost everybody at 18 millimeters can tolerate a regular diet. So again, I set some parameters for patients, not mentioned by Dr. Barron, but I, I also would recommend a two to four week interval if you're needing sequentially to dilate these people, let them to heal up a little bit. You don't need to go but so fast and, and so quickly. Number six is use a stiff guide wire when passing a rigid scope. I would concur with this. And in particular, I use fluoroscopy in these patients. In particular, if it's a rigid, uh, a, a rigid dilator, I like fluoroscopy. In particular, what I want to see is the, the bow of the tip of that rigid, dial, rigid uh, um, wire. In particular, I don't want it in the fundus. I don't want it in, into the greater curvature. And what I'm looking for is a gentle bow along the greater curvature stretching into the antrum. Now, with that being said, uh, what we want to do is when we come off these stiffer wires is, is note that the stiff wire will come back when you draw off of it. So I'll have my assistant watch what I'm coming back and we'll do a to and fro. I'll come back, 
10 millimeters and she'll push in or he will push in 10 millimeters. So we'll kind of do a to and fro watching. So we, we again, fluoroscopically confirm this, that we maintain that gentle bow and the greater curvature. Number seven, always consider eosinophilic esophagitis when evaluating patients with suspected benign esophageal strictures. We see EOE more and more. It's not just a disease of young males anymore. But again, this is something that you need to understand because these patients uh, do tend to have a mucosal tear very deep, very early, and it's something that we need to maybe be a little bit more conservative on and, and again, set appropriate guidance for dilation. I like the bougie dilators in these patients more so, in particular if they have concentric rings. Uh, the balloon dilation does, just doesn't seem to provide that longitudinal uh, uh, dilation as you go down the length of the esophagus. So again, I think Todd's point about uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, don't forget it and understand it and think about it and in particular look at uh, your dilation st strategy around that. Next is use larger diameter balloons when you or bougies when you start to look outside of EOE. In particular, we're talking about Schatzky's ring, very, very membranous type dilation uh, um, targets here and 18 millimeters or greater is the typical size. And again, these are things that you need to factor in where you start, but again, these things are typically low risk of perforation. So target here is, is greater in particular with the 15, 18 millimeters to 20 millimeter balloon, which is what we standardly would use. Number nine is post endoscopic evaluation should be performed to assess response in particular in adverse events. And I would wholeheartedly agree. I use this in particular in complicated strictures and EOE if I'm doing dilations because I wanna look for those deep mucosal tears. That's my bailout point, not looking at rule of three. I'm not looking at anything other than if I see a mucosal tear that's deep, I wanna stop at that point. So the endoscopic reevaluation is important. A tip I would add here is deflate the, the stomach as you go forward. Again, when you're doing sequential dilations, if you're using balloon dilator, you may be in, uh, cognizantly or, or subconsciously putting air in there, and I don't want the, the stomach distended where the patient may now retch or belch when the patient uh, has a balloon dilator in their esophagus. So basically creating an esophageal obstruction by our dilation balloon and creating a risk for barotrauma, which you would see proximal to that balloon. So again, deflate as you go forward. Don't forget, take your finger off the insufflation button and, and put it on the suction button. Number 10 is severe chest pain. Really after uncomplicated dilation of a, a benign stricture should prompt evaluation for possible perforation. The exception here I would add and more is in the patient that has EOE. So I routinely would recommend EOE patients that, that may be warned that they're gonna have a little bit of chest pain or chest discomfort. I find this almost universal and again, something that precludes at least some of the anticipatory concerns. Deep, uh, boring pain and concerns of perforation obviously would prompt an evaluation with the idea of either re-endoscope and, and fixing it at the time if you saw a uh, through and through perforation, appropriate measures there, or if the patient comes back, obviously, to evaluate them with a, a water-soluble contrast. So again, don't let the patient go if they're having chest pain. Kudos to Dr. Barron for giving us the opportunity to say what his top 10 are, and, and uh, it's given me an opportunity to reflect on 40 years of doing this as well, and looking at ways that we hopefully can optimize your patient outcome and, and hopefully keep us away from the dreaded complications that are part and parcel of anything we do, but in particular as it relates to esophageal dilation. I'm Dr. David Johnson. Thanks again for listening.